Well, hello everyone. Here we are again. Um, it is April 30th. Uh, at least that's the day I'm assigning this. So once again, put something from April 30th for this day in history and a famous person born on this day in history, April 30th. So we're on the last day of April and we've only got uh, you know, a little over a week of school left. I mean, a week of regular school pretty much and then <clears throat> finals week. So we're almost finished. Um, obviously, I do want to address one thing before I start notes today. Um, I'd hope to get further. I'd hope to, you know, actually get into World War II, which amazingly we're not going to be able to. Um, but don't fear. Uh, when we do U.S. history, I'm hoping most of you, if not all of you, will still be uh, at our school, you know, junior year. Um, we will spend extra time on World War II and do a lot of stuff uh, that I would have done this year. But I didn't want to give you three to four notes videos every week. Um, which if we'd have been in regular school, we'd have got this stuff faster. But I don't want to, however, skip the stuff that we're going over right now either. I think it's interesting to see uh, how the Nazis and Hitler were able to come to power, which today they're not going to quite get into power, but they're going to get pretty close. Um, and we're going to look at kind of the role the Great Depression took on allowing the Nazis to become a more prevalent political party in Germany. So before we move on, with the Great Depression, I, just uh, as we go into this, we're looking primarily at Germany and the impact the Great Depression had on Germany and on um, the political movement of the Nazis during the Great this early Great Depression era. Um, I say that because I'm we're not going to discuss like the Great Depression's impact on the United States. This is world history, not U.S. history. Uh, once again, when you take U.S. history in two years, we'll hit the Great Depression in, in a lot of detail in the United States, but the important thing to know is the Great Depression was not just a move in the United States, it was international. Uh, every country in the world was affected by the Great Depression. Um, there are factors that played into that and why it hit everybody. Uh, partly the global economy is connected, um, but there were, there were other reasons as well with some actions the United States took and other nations against each other, which led to a slowdown in trade <clears throat> on top of already the other things that were happening. Well, as we think about Germany uh, going into this Great Depression, Germany had struggled after World War I pretty severely. But by 1926, 1927, Germany's economy got to, got to where it was doing quite a bit better and things were going well. That's when you really saw the Nazi party stop growing and things weren't going that well for the Nazi party and they didn't have a lot of support. So. I bring that up because I say, in contrast to what we're going to talk about today, if things had kept going well in Germany, the Nazis probably would never would have got the support necessary to come to power. So the Great Depression does play a big role in, in causing people uh, to support uh, the Nazis, at least in a high enough number that they have some popularity. Uh, although I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but we're going to see that, that they never have the majority of the people behind them, but they do have a significant number behind them because of the Great Depression, which helps them seize control. So unemployment hit uh, Germany pretty bad. Um, like I said, things had been going pretty well, but the Great Depression hits. And um, in Germany, it's a little bit different. Even in the United States, it becomes an all out battlefield. Uh, me and battlefield, I'm not saying everybody went to the streets with guns and killing each other, but in America, uh, despite the fact that there was a Great Depression going on, there also was a sense of cooperation uh, and there was a sense of compassion uh, towards people. Whereas in Germany, uh, hopelessness and hate rose. Uh, shop owners had lost their businesses, railed against big department stores. The jobless loathed their bosses. Undergraduates in college Ordered hopes of employment and civil service turned their wrath against the government. Uh, the peasants turned against city dwellers, even urban jobless people envied peasants because those peasants at least had crops that they could grow for their own food. So what I mean by that is in America, there wasn't a lot of animosity between different groups of people. For the most part, people were discouraged and unemployment was really bad, of course, but 
people uh, were supportive and helpful. Whereas in Germany, it's more this person against this person, this group against this group, and there's just a lot of animosity between those groups. Of the total population of about 50 million people, eventually 6 million German people were jobless, uh, which actually, if we look at that number, doesn't seem too high uh, compared to because the United States gets to 25% um, unemployed during this era in history, uh, which up to that point in time, well, up to this point in time in history, 25% is the worst America's ever had it. And that still is technically the worst America's ever had it. But right now, coming out of the uh, global pandemic of, pan uh, of uh, COVID-19, who knows, we might come out and have more than 25% unemployed, at least for a time. Hopefully, America's economy will recover this time pretty quickly, which it did not during the Great Depression. Uh, but that number is deceiving. That doesn't include the amount of people that maybe had part-time jobs, but that that job was not enough to really support their family. Um, so, like I said, a deceptive number. However, you know, you're looking at a number that is well, that is definitely over 10%, um, which is bad enough. Uh, and it probably was, you know, more like 15 to 20% when you look at the amount of people who weren't even looking for jobs anymore and the amount of people who couldn't uh, get full-time jobs. So it's a pretty terrible mark uh, on uh, the job market in Germany. So with new elections coming around <clears throat> in uh, the early 30s, um, and I've got different years here, but I'm trying to show you the growth over time. Uh, the Nazis were able to take, take a little bit of a, uh, a stand and and say that they had an alternative uh, to what the government was doing. They also continued to be very anti-communist, anti-Jewish, as as you guys are probably well aware by now. They denounced the Versailles Treaty, which that was very unpopular in Germany, so that appealed to people as well. Uh, but they started a new campaign slogan known as "For Freedom and for Bread." The elections in May of 1928, the Nazis polled about 3.6% of the total votes cast in Germany, 3.6%, okay? So you can tell as you get in before the Great Depression, Nazis weren't very popular. By September of 1931, in these elections here, they went up to 18.3% and gained 107 seats in the Reichstag. Uh, the Reichstag, I think I've mentioned it before, but that is basically the uh, German parliament is what they would call it. Um, that's the name for the parliament. That's also the name of the building where they meet as well. So the Reichstag, uh, they became the second largest party in the legislature as a result. So now they are the second largest party. 18% is still not very high, however. Um, what was kind of stunning was the group of people who voted for the Nazis. One, they did improve in every class. Uh, so I'm saying, they had more pe poor people vote for them than ever before. But really, the two groups that helped them the most were the middle class and the wealthy um, that helped them gain a good percentage of votes. So this was an impressive showing in the polls for the Nazi party. They seem maybe on the verge, however, of breaking apart uh, as they're refuting factions within the party. And this is primarily uh, around the SA, or the group we call the Stormtroopers. Uh, and especially the stormtroopers in Berlin. They distrusted Nazi leaders. Uh, the Berlin stormtroopers uh, felt that the wealthy inside the Nazi party uh, were kind of living it up and were courting big business and that they were, they weren't, they were living more like aristocrats and they didn't care about the average everyday people. Um, so they came to resent the, the lifestyle of the wealthier Nazi leaders. Um, so what happens here is that the stormtroopers say we're no, they were no longer going to protect party meetings in Berlin, the Berlin stormtroopers. This isn't all of them, but the ones in Berlin. In response, in uh, autumn of 1931, Hitler came to Berlin. He removed Franz von Pfeffer uh, as head of the SA and put himself in command of the organization. He also continued to live as he always had which was not lavishly. Hitler actually lived pretty modestly considering he was fairly wealthy by this point in time. 
this did serve to diffuse a lot of the complaints that uh, he lived like a Nazi elite. So he seemed a little bit, I'm not gonna say like a commoner, but a little bit like a commoner, at least in the way he lived, which did diffuse some of the issues uh, and ease some of the problems with the SA in Berlin. However, even though Hitler took command, he's very busy. You know, he could not devote all of his time to controlling the stormtrooper issues in Berlin. So he turned over the day-to-day -day, day -day management to uh, Ernst Röhm, who was a former officer in the military, and he played a leading part in the Beer Hall Pooch, which failed, which we talked about a couple lectures ago. Uh, his current assignment was to assure the SA members, the average stormtroopers in Berlin, that when the Nazis finally rose to national power, they would get their share of the spoils. Some SA members were mollified, but overall satisfaction plummeted. Uh, the, Germ the Nazis were working on trying to show the German voters that they were going to act legally in trying to come to power and were um, determined to appear as much like a normal political party as possible. So Hitler actually ordered the SA units to stop street fighting. But for quite a few people in the SA, this was the reason they were in the Nazi party. They were thugs. They were street fighters. They had been parts of gangs in the past. And this is what they really lived for, some of the people in the SA. So the ban on violence triggered a major revolt. Some stormtroopers even broke with the Nazi party and joined the Communist Party. Um, for Hitler, it was the last straw. So he directed Hermann Goering to purge the SA of dissidents. And we'll have Goering, um, well, he's really more important in World War II. Goering eventually becomes the head of the Nazi Air Force, which was the Luftwaffe. Um, Hitler temporarily dissolved the SA organization. He cut the budget of the SA and refused permission for them to recruit any new members. At the same time, he began to replace the SA with a new organization. Now. When I say new organization, this organization is not new, but it is going to take on a new role and kind of be what the SA was. Uh, and this organization is known as the SS or the Stuchstaffel, which means defense echelon. Like I said, the SS had been in existence since 1925. They had kind of been the secret service. I know SS kind of makes sense, but they had been primarily in responsible for being the bodyguards for Hitler and other party officials at party rallies. So the SS have been kind of like private bodyguards for Hitler. Now, they're going to obviously expand their role and do more than just the protecting part. They're going to take over a lot of what the SA was doing. In 1929, a, the SS began to change, partly because um, a new person was made the head of the SS. His name was Heinrich Himmler. Um, also, because we're not going to get to cover a lot of World War II, you know, if, you know, obviously, primarily the Nazis are hated, and they should be. I mean, what they stood for um, with Jewish people and other people and how they treated minorities and that type of thing, obviously, should be very hated. Uh, but if you were to make a list of Nazis to hate the most, I guess you would say, in history, Obviously, Hitler would be at the top, but Himmler might be second. Um, and Goebbels, who I'm going to talk about here, might be third. Uh, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, the SS is eventually the group that is in charge of the Nazi death camps and the concentration camps. So Himmler um, is one of those uh, people who uh, does a lot of terrible things. Uh, so I'm just I'm just putting that out there. Um, he looked like a meat clerk. He looked or like maybe even like a, a school teacher. In fact, he came from an academic family. His father was a professor at the University of Munich. He was college educated. Um, he wasn't brilliant, but he was intelligent. Um, he was very capable. His chief interests were mathematics, Latin, and Greek. Uh, he went on to study at his father's university specializing in biology and chemistry. So he's a smart guy. Uh, in the chaos following World War I, Himmler found work as a wire piling clerk. Uh, once he hooked up with the Nazis, he eventually took over the SS and became a master of the dossier. Uh, so dossiers, 
this is basically a uh, folder with documents where he's been spying on people. Uh, this is also happening within the Nazi party. In fact, it seems likely that Heinrich Himmler even had a dossier on Hitler. Uh, to maintain his files, like I said, he uh, had spies who worked for him. One of his own agents found that Ernst Röhm, the head of the SA, uh, was an unknown rival to Himmler, uh, was homosexual. Now, Himmler doesn't tell Hitler about this right away, but he does stash that away for future use. Um, so there's even high up Nazi leaders are being spied upon by Nazis, including possibly Hitler. I mean, Himmler had files on pretty much everybody. Uh, the other guy I mentioned as another hated Nazi uh, was Joseph Goebbels. Now, he's been in a past uh, slide. Um, but here's an important thing I really want you to know um, for him. He, uh, to try to centralize the Nazi movement more and make it less localized, uh, they decided to put everything under central control. Uh, when, I, when I say localized, the Nazi party hadn't, you know, they kind of had let different local groups lead what they were doing, um, and they didn't have a unified message as a result. So instead, they decided to make one unified message, and they make it to where Joseph Goebbels is the head of Nazi propaganda, uh, and no local group can use their own propaganda. They have to do what the national leadership under Joseph Goebbels tells them to do. So every detail is put under the party headquarters, which has now moved to Berlin. And the Soviet Union, obviously, Vladimir Lenin at this point in time is still in control. Um, And he had developed a principle of democratic centralism. The idea was that there could be discussion before a decision was reached, but once the decision had been made, there could not be any dissent. So that was how Lenin led. I mean, he was the ultimate leader. At the same time, people could discuss things, but once that decision was made, you had to get on board. Hitler takes it a step further. There is no discussion, there is no dissent, and Hitler's word is law. So whatever Hitler says goes, and he doesn't really need your input. Now, him and Goebbels would work pretty closely together. He probably would have a couple people like Goebbels and Himmler uh, and, uh, you know, probably Goering, who I mentioned a little bit ago. These are the three people probably that could have discussions with Hitler, but otherwise no one else had any discussions with him and you could not really question Hitler's decisions. Well, the Nazis began to attack the Weimar Republic, not in a way where they got out into street fighting. Once again, they're, they're kind of trying to appear as a normal political party. So Hitler starts to uh, try to present himself as an ordinary politician working within the normal political system. Uh, this is the image he wants to project, project. Obviously, he's doing this in the hope that once he's in power, he can take over power. So he says he support, supports the Weimar Constitution which is true until he gets into power and then he wants to overthrow the constitution. Uh, he talks about coordinating with other political parties. Uh, at the same time, he's really engaged in trying to eliminate political opponents. He also wants to eliminate trade unions, religious organizations, and universities, and all groups that could act against the Nazi regime at some point in time. Hitler's, uh, politically, Hitler was very perceptive. Uh, very insightful. Uh, he does know how to play politics uh, very well. And uh, he begins to court the middle class, not because the Nazis are primarily a middle class movement. I mean, remember it was the German workers, National Socialist German Workers Party. Their hope was to get the lower class because the lower class make up a large number of people. But at this point in time, Hitler realizes the lower class don't vote a lot of times, but the middle class do show up to vote. So he begins to say, well, this is the group we need, like, really need to focus on because they're the ones who are actually going to show up and vote. So he sets out to penetrate interest groups that represent the German middle class. The Nazis also organized their own interest groups uh, on behalf of mom and pop establishments. So this would be your small businesses. They try to help aid them as much as they can and they campaigned against large department stores. 
who they said were run exclusively by, you probably might be able to guess it, Jewish people. Uh, in the second half of 1931, the Nazis slipped into every institution of the Weimar Republic, the civil service, into schools, into the military, even into the police forces in Bavaria and Berlin. So the Nazis really um, infiltrate every part of the government. In 1931, they have an immense rally of 100,000 party members where they march in Brunswick. Uh, they, they continue to do well in local elections. Their memberships begin to grow uh, as the people that are part of the Nazi party. And in a huge rally, another huge rally, not the one with 100,000, but another huge rally in 1932, uh, Hitler says the movement is approaching its last hour of the march. He predicted that. Uh, 1932 would be the first year of the Third Reich. It's not going to quite be the first year, but it's going to be close. Um, Hitler is pretty clear that he doesn't want to do an illegal takeover of power. He'd already tried that with the Beer Hall Pooch, but he wants to come to power through legal means. <clears throat> so even though they have considerable gains and their party is growing, they still don't have over 50%, and they never are going to have over 50% but they do continue to grow. Now, <clears throat> at this point in time, Paul von Hindenburg, uh, who had been a, a war veteran uh, and an important war veteran from World War I was the president <clears throat> of Germany. So they have a, a, a different, a unique political system. They have a president and a chancellor uh, and they work together. The chancellor kind of heads up the, the legislative stuff, the lawmaking process uh, and, and is a very powerful person. But the president is probably the most powerful person. The president is the one in charge of the military. And the president um, appoints the chancellor. So the president has a lot of power. Uh, and Hindenburg is getting very old. He's getting pretty senile. Uh, he's also, because of that, pretty susceptible to bribery. Um, Hindenburg began to act like a king, not just a president. So, I mean, his... Uh, place of residence and his office in Berlin uh, looked more like a royal court where he saw himself kind of as the proper successor to Kaiser Wilhelm II. Uh, he, uh, during this time period, establishes a new commander of the army, General Kurt von Schleicher. Uh, in 1930, Schleicher had gone to Hindenburg to recommend a new chancellor, Heinrich Brüning. Uh, he was an honest civil servant who cherished the ancient conservative values of old Germany and didn't, uh, Bruning didn't like the Nazis. He also didn't like the communists. So that's a, the kind of person that uh, certainly uh, uh, Hindenburg would seem to support. Hindenburg and Bruning both feared the Nazis and tried to suppress them. They forbid stormtroopers to march in their iconic brown shirts as an example, uh, because when they marched around in those shirts, it did bring some fear to people. At the same time, without Bruning's knowledge, General Schleicher was urging Hindenburg to, uh, and the defense minister to refrain from taking steps against the Nazis. Okay, so Bruning's kind of against the Nazis. Hindenburg has leans towards being against the Nazis. You might be like, why is Schleicher wanting to take steps against the Nazis? Now, Schleicher is not a Nazi himself at all, but he does believe since the military for Germany must remain so small. Um, he does believe that the Nazis could provide the, the German government with some protection and a reserve militia. Um, you know, Schleicher does have a fear of communists as well as Hindenburg does and Brüning does. So he's trying to convince the, the government that the Nazis could play a role he wants to kind of integrate the Nazis into the government. Um, not that, like I said, he's not a Nazi himself. He's kind of naive, obviously, in doing some of these things. Uh, but he, he said, if we integrate the Nazis into it and we can use their force to help stop communism, for that, um, Hindenburg is on board and he's willing to give in to some of the demands of Schleicher. <clears throat> so Schleicher and uh, Bruning get together and they decide to invite Hitler to join them in making a decision to try to extend Hindenburg's term. So this means he wouldn't even have to run for re-election. Like, let's just 
he's been president for seven years at this point in time. And they're like, let's just let him continue to be president for as long as he wants to be. So they get together and they meet. Hitler is not willing to go along with this. Uh, I mean, they said if they actually told Hitler, if if you'll go along with us and we can extend uh, Hindenburg's term, we will have him name you chancellor. But Hitler turns down the chancellorship and says, no, Hitler instead decides to run uh, for president. Because technically the president's kind of more powerful than the chancellor. He decides to run for president against Hindenburg. Um, this was in the video you guys watched, Hitler loses. Uh, it's not, he doesn't even come that close. Hindenburg's very popular, so uh, Hindenburg is reelected. Re so at, the, at this point in time, people thought Hitler had made a huge blunder. And in some ways, he did make a blunder to some degree, but it doesn't end up backfiring on him uh, like many thought it would. Um, Bruning announced after Hindenburg is reelected uh, that all SA and SS activities of the Nazi party would be banned and that the police and army would start to work against Hitler's groups. Uh, Bruning was not aware, however, that of what was going on around him. General Schleicher once again was conspiring against him. He once again, he thought integrating the Nazis into the party, I mean, into the government could be helpful in providing protection for the government. Schleicher's trick was to get a group of Prussian landlords to visit Hindenburg and denounce Bruning as an agrarian Bolshevist. Now, Bolshevist is a communist, so Schleicher is going to accuse Bruning of working with communists. Um, and in 1932, May, May of 1932, Hindenburg announced that he fired Bruning. The chancellorship was now open. General Schleicher knew who he wanted to fill it. And it is not Hitler. It's a man named Franz von Poppen, who had family ties to big business uh, and the kind of person that would appeal to Hindenburg. Schleicher and Hitler struck a deal. Hitler would go along with von Poppen as chancellor on one condition that the government lift its ban on the SA and SS. So the deal was done. At that very point, Hitler had planned as Pitt Hitler planned, violence erupted, especially in and around Berlin, as you began to see communists and Nazis provoking each other, engaging in pitched battles in the streets. In July alone, 86 people died in the fighting in Berlin. Um, much like our government, our government is not called a federation. We're, well, we have a federalist, federalist type of government, so it is kind of a federation. Um, but they also had a German type of government, which is a federation meaning that you had national government and local governments, and they tried to share power. But um, it comes out that all the conservative landowners in Prussia were using their powers to give measures of protection to workers and other left-wing organizations. This came to a crashing end because Van Poppen then decided to abolish the Prussian government because they once again were fearful that communisms were infiltrating into the government of Russia. So you begin to see the national government take on more power and more authority over local governments. In July, Germany held elections in the Reichstag. This time, although they did not win, a majority of the Nazis were now the largest party. Hitler uh, took a hard line with Schott, um, sorry, Schleicher and Hindenburg. Uh, and he had gave him a take it or leave it proposal. He would accept Schleicher as defense minister, but he wanted the chancellorship for himself because, and he wanted Nazis in the most important cabinet positions, which actually, um, I know we may be like, well, that's a big thing to ask for. T technically, if you're the head of the largest party, you typically did become chancellor. So that actually was a pretty normal request for someone during this time period. Uh, but instead of offering him the chancellorship and dismissing Van Poppen, Hindenburg offered Hitler only the vice chancellorship. Hitler turned him down and was very angry. Just he did, as he'd hoped, however, no party in the Reichstag made up a majority and the rift between the, the different parties on the different sides was so deep that they could not form a coalition government. So once again, when you don't have a, a majority party that has over 50%, you have to try to work together with other, other, other parties. And the Nazis certainly aren't gonna do that because they want a new election. So they are able to force a new election. Van Poppen was left with no choice but to do that. That was the ch chancellor's job. 
interestingly, is you see a setback here, but there's going to be some positives for the Nazis coming out of this November 1932 election. So before this election, earlier in 1932, the Nazis had gained 37.3% of the vote. That's the highest the Nazis ever got, 37.3%. Uh, by this election in November 1932, they had dropped to 33.1 percent of the vote. But look who gained votes. The communists gained six million votes. And if you combine the Social Democrats and the communists, so basically the socialists and the communists together, uh, they made up 13 million of the votes and the Nazis had 14.6 million of the votes. So you had the communists and socialists, if they combined, <laughs> almost as strong as the Nazis. Um, this is where we're finishing notes today, but this is an important thing to remember. Because uh, Hindenburg's not gonna ever like the Nazis. Even Schleicher and Van Poppen aren't gonna be on board with the Nazis for everything they want to do. However, they all have the same enemy, which is communism uh, and to some degree socialism, the more radical socialists who are in, in a lot of ways communists, uh, that does give them um, well, we're going to see next time, but that is part of the reason, reasoning behind them allowing Hitler to become chancellor. So uh, I don't have an extra question this time today. So just uh, enjoy your weekend. Um, continue working on your final project, though. I would do a little bit of that over the weekend. Uh, remember, your statistics part of it is due this week on Saturday. Uh, and I would suggest, like I said, continue working on others, but I will assign some other parts to, to work on next week. Uh, you don't have, I mean, you still have a decent amount of time, but you, you only have about a week and a half to finish that. So don't procrastinate and put it off. So uh, I'll be signing off. Thanks guys for listening. And uh, like I said, have a great weekend. Bye.